And I'm saying to you, my friends, that people in that sort of shape uh, stand in dire need of God's so great salvation. Now this morning will you hear me when I say that it is my deepest conviction that sin being what it is and Satan being whom and who he is and this world lying in the wicked one as it does and hell popping on every direction and the spirit of the world being prepared to uh, bow down and accept the devil's Christ, Antichrist. And when the blow winds are blowing from every direction, the icy character of them upon the, the hotness of the gospel of Christ, I say to you that it's my conviction. Now this doesn't make it so, but it is my conviction and I do not ask anybody else to share it, but it is my conviction, and I'll stand for it. And the best I know, I'll bear the consequences of preaching this conviction. It is my conviction that the most urgent task facing us today is the recovery of the gospel of the grace of Almighty God. And because that is my conviction... I'm asking men and women to stand by each Lord's Day for several more Lord's Days as pretty soon we're going to try to preach the gospel of God's grace. Thus far we've been providing a setting for its preaching for the scriptures say where sin did abound grace did much more abound and sin does abound now. And oh, the deepest desire of my heart is that once again in America, as of days of yore, that men in the predicament of sin and bound by the cords of Satan himself shall once more hear not in isolated places but everywhere the glorious gospel of the abounding grace of a holy God in Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm saying to you that man needs a great salvation. Is Satan is half as powerful as the Bible says he is, if sin is as deadly as the Bible says it is, if sin taking occasion in the flesh and being spurred on by the law and influenced by Satan has caused the situation that we're in today, then I say to you that people in that shape cannot, cannot, and they must not be allowed to live this life out without ever hearing the true gospel of the grace of God. And the grace of God is simply the grace of God of all grace providing in Christ Jesus a great salvation to meet the need of great sinners who are guilty of great sin. This is the theme of the gospel of God Almighty as it is in Christ Jesus. Now, my friends, that gospel, that good news, that proclamation that does not result in men and women being saved in the Bible sense of that term cannot be God's gospel. That gospel that turns out men and women short of being saved in the Bible sense cannot be the gospel of God. It is not the gospel of salvation as preached by the Apostle Paul and as is so sorely needed to be preached today. To be saved from sin, to be brought into right relation to God, calls for a great salvation and it will need to be a great gospel which proclaims such a great salvation for such great sinners. Now my conviction is, and you want to hear me now, don't go away now, my conviction is that the gospel needs to be recovered. And when I say that the gospel needs to be recovered, 
I naturally am also seeing that the gospel in its fullness, that the gospel in its purity, that the gospel in its power has been to a greater or a lesser extent in your day and mine been well nigh lost. In the word of God we are told that the Lord Jesus Christ came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. The Lord said in his first proclamation that the gospel needs to be believed. The gospel needs to be believed. That the entrance into the kingdom of God is by way of repentance toward God and by way of believing the gospel. Now the Lord Jesus Christ believed that it was important that the gospel be believed. Great sinners standing in the need <coughs> of great salvation need not only that the gospel shall be preached, but they need to hear it. And upon hearing, they need to believe it. Salvation, according to the word of God, is the blessed heaven-given boon for men and women who believe the gospel. Therefore, nothing is so important as that the gospel be preached and that the gospel be believed. Now, I have said that for a hundred years we have well nigh lost this wonderful gospel. And I want this morning, having made such a convicted statement and having declared that my conviction is that our most urgent task is to recover this gospel, I want you to hear me as I buttress or recommend my conviction to you to recommend that you need to hear what I have to say as I make the statement that the real gospel is well nigh be lost and that men in the terrible condition they're in now are not hearing the gospel that saves men if it's believed. To recommend that conviction, I offer several suggestions and the first one is this, the great perplexity and the awful unrest which is growing every single day among those who earnestly seek to teach and to preach the gospel of Christ. My friends, we are blind as bats if we do not stop and take notice of the fact that there is today growing everywhere a tremendous dissatisfaction with things as they are within our churches. The matter of real evangelism, the matter of Bible holiness, the matter of real New Testament discipline, the matter of gospel fruit, the matter of Christ-like character, the matter of Holy Spirit power, the matter of formal or historical faith in the stead of a living, regnant, believing, obedient faith. My friends, these things are occupying the attention of men today and great is the disturbance and the dissatisfaction and the unrest everywhere. Now, brother, if you are not concerned about the absence of real sure enough evangelism and real sure enough holiness and real sure enough discipline and real sure enough gospel fruit and real sure enough growth of Christ-like character and real absence of Holy Ghost power and the fact that our creeds are believed and the Christ is missed. If you're not concerned about those things, then of course I'm not talking in a way that you'll be sympathetic with. But I will say this, that whether you believe it or not, there is great dissatisfaction now and God's Spirit is back of that dissatisfaction. Men are crying out today for something that's real 
And we preachers had better feast that. And with this awful perplexity and unrest, there is a great uncertainty as to the road ahead. What shall a day bring forth? Do you mean tell me we're going to go on like we are now, playing church and making out like we believe the great vital doctrines of Christ? And I tell you, no, something is in the wind. Nobody exactly knows what it is. But this awful unrest and this tremendous uncertainty has behind it the power of the Holy Ghost trying to flush us out of our nest of rest and unbelief into the real certainties of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I tell you, I believe that at the root of all this perplexity and unrest and uncertainty, I believe at the root of all of it is the fact that we have lost our grip on the Bible gospel. We have lost this grip whether we've meant to or not. For a century, we have bartered the true gospel for a substitute product, which though this substitute does look similar enough in some points of detail, it is as a whole a decidedly different gospel from the gospel written about and put down in the holy word of God. And thus our troubles for this substitute product that's called the gospel today does not answer the ends for which the authentic gospel has in past days proved itself so mighty. This new gospel, as I call it, it's everywhere, and it's preached by those of us who call ourselves believers in the Bible. It's preached by men who have much zeal and much devotion and much courage, but whether their devotion is right or not, their gospel is wrong, for the gospel as it's preached today conspicuously fails to produce in its hearers first deep reverence for God. Second, this new gospel is failing to produce in its hearers second deep repentance toward God. This new gospel is failing to produce in its hearers deep humility and this gospel is failing to produce in its hearers a deep spirit of worship. In short, the gospel as it's preached today fails to produce Christians. Now that's a tremendous charge, but God help us it so. The gospel as it's preached today produces lots of converts. It produces lots of church members, but it produces Christians I'm not so sure. My friends, it seems to change some of the ways of men and women, but it leaves men and women unchanged. Brother Barnard, you telling the truth, you know I am. Preacher brother, you know I'm telling the truth. God help us. We need to come to the mourners being chair. No use turn off that radio and get mad. I'm not God, but I'm speaking now, and I'm telling you the truth. Our gospel we preach today gets men to quit some of their bad habits and keep others, but our gospel does not produce Christians. Now, this isn't an idle statement. This isn't the ranting of a fool. This needs to be faced. Why this awful failure? Why, with as much preaching and as many church members and as much zeal and as much courage and as much devotion and as much tears as we have today, are we turning out by the gospel we preached people who have missed Christ? Well, I tell you what I believe, and I'm on the mourner's bench about it, and these programs are dedicated to it, and the people who give the money to pay for them are back of it, and people pray. I believe the reason for the failure to turn out Christians, men and women who are really saved, lies in the character and the content of the gospel as it's preached today. 
I say to you in the first place that this new gospel, this substitute gospel, this popular gospel that's everywhere today, I say to you, it fails to get men, make men God-centered in their thoughts and God-fearing in their hearts. Because if we'd be honest, brethren, that hadn't been the aim of our preaching. We haven't tried to make men God-centered in their thoughts where he's uppermost and God-fearing in their hearts. We've just tried to make some more converts. And brother, anything that comes along that puts a damper on our making of converts, we'll fight it till we're blue in the face. We're going to have what we call results, even if in the having of the results we're not true to Christ and we're not true to men. And our converts do not give evidence of being saved. My friend, one way of stating the difference between this gospel they call it today and the gospel of our forefathers, one way of stating that difference is to say that the gospel preached today is too exclusively concerned to be helpful to man. It's in concern to bring peace to men, to bring comfort to men, to bring happiness to men, to bring satisfaction to men. And the so-called gospel today is utterly too little concern to bring glory to God. Brother and sister, the old gospel your granddaddy heard and believed was helpful too. In fact, it is more helpful than this new gospel. But the concern of the old gospel was first, last, and always to give glory to God. The old gospel was always and essentially a proclamation of divine sovereignty and mercy and judgment. It was a summons to men and women to bow down and worship the mighty Lord on whom man depends for all good, both in nature and in grace. In the old gospel, its center of reference was Almighty God. But in the new gospel of today, the center of reference is man. The chief aim of the old gospel was to teach men and women to worship God. The concern of the new gospel seems limited to making men feel better. The subject of the old gospel was God and his ways with men. The subject of this new gospel is man and the help God gives him. There is a world of difference. The whole purpose and emphasis of gospel preaching has almost completely changed in your day and mine. And from this change of interest has sprung a change of content for the new gospel has an effect reformulated the Bible message in the supposed interest of helpfulness. Therefore, the themes of man's natural inability to believe, of God's free election being the ultimate cause of salvation, and of the fact that Christ is really a Savior in the sense that those for whom he died are really to be saved. Those great themes are not preached today. Today I hear it on every hand that these doctrines, namely man's inability in himself to believe, namely God's free election of grace, and namely the fact that Christ actually died to save somebody, not just to make it possible for some to be saved. I'm told on every hand today that such preaching is not helpful. I'm told that such preaching drives sinners to despair by suggesting to them that it is not in their power to be saved through Christ. And I know that the possibility that such despair might be good 
is not even considered. For it's taken for granted today that this despair that sinners need to be brought to cannot be good because it's so shattering to our own self-esteem. And I stand before this microphone and tell you now that unless our preaching brings sinners to the place of utter despair of any hope within themselves or anything they can do, we're not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. My friends, the result of leaving out these signally important things that buttress the gospel of Christ is that part of the Bible gospel is now preached as if it were the whole of that gospel. But I warn you, my friend, that a half-truth masquerading as a whole truth becomes an un a complete truth. And I want to ask you now if the fallen is not too much true, hear me now. First, isn't it true that today we appeal to men as if they all had the ability to receive Christ at any time? I put that down. That's exactly what they're preaching today. In the second place, isn't it true that we speak of Christ's redeeming work as if he had done no more by dying than make it possible for us to save ourselves by believing. You listen. That's exactly what's being preached today. Isn't it true in the third place that we speak of God's love as if it were no more than a general willingness to receive any who will turn and trust? That's exactly what sinners are told today. Isn't it true that today we depict the Father and the Son not as sovereignly acting in drawing sinners to themselves but is waiting in quiet impotence at the door of our hearts. My friends, that's what's being preached today. Maybe that's what people believe but I say with all my power that this set of half-truths is something other than God's gospel. And I say that the Bible is against such preaching and the fact that such preaching has become almost standard practice only shows how urgent it is that we shall look at it closely. I say to you that by their fruit ye shall know preachers and by the fruit of the gospel we shall know it. And so I'm going to ask you as my time has slipped up on me to be standing by next Lord's Day as I take up where I've left off here and take a look at the preaching of today as against the preaching of two generations ago. May God bless you everyone.